This is a for very familiar to us, right? Often very familiar to us as a children's story. And it's something that the children love the story of Noah and the Ark. Well, we want to talk about the covenant that God makes with Noah. And I actually have some props. And so it's going to look like a children's sermon at first. But as somebody said to me in the back, it's the children of God. We're all the children of God, right? So I have a beluga. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to the Shedd Aquarium in uh, Chicago, but the belugas are there, and you can see the new baby beluga. Actually, it's not that small, but we have a cow. <coughs> these are these, these little ones are childhood uh, toys, which some people tell me to sell on eBay. But <laughs> we have a cow. Uh, we have a badger. Uh, we have a collie, because uh, I have a collie, and the collie lives in my home, so the collie shows up all over the place. Uh, we have a very small elephant, which is kind of ironic. We have a very large snowshoe here. <laughs> when we 
we consider the other creatures of the earth. Now I want to start by thinking about covenant. Okay, we've heard that term several times in the reading. God establishes a covenant with humanity and with all of creation, mentioning the earth, mentioning all creatures, including the large ones, which I think is very interesting. All the large creatures. And the rainbow that we saw is meant as a reminder of that covenant. Now that phrase, covenant, we don't use it a lot in our everyday kind of modern speaking. It's used in special circumstances. The Hebrew root of the word is tied to fetter or binding. The idea of a covenant is it is a binding agreement. It is a bond that's formed. Okay, so there's a strength there. It's a binding relationship. In scripture, there are covenants between people. Jonathan and David, for example, had a covenant together that was witnessed by God. Okay? Jonathan and David, one place. There are others among people. There are also covenants between God and humanity consisting of promises, such as with Abraham, and obligations, <coughs> such as with Moses and the law. And then here in Genesis, we have the covenant between God and creation. And in the New Testament, of course, a covenant is made between God and humanity through Jesus. This, too, has elements of promise and obligation. And that is what's held in tension within the covenant, a promise and an obligation. Most biblical literature focuses on God's covenant with humanity, which Christ no one because it has to do with us. Okay. That's why we focus on it. The covenant made following the flood isn't given as much attention by Christians. It is actually in Judaism. Okay. And this is to our detriment, I think. So keep in mind as we talk about this, the focus of covenant is on promise and on obligation. It follows from God's covenant with us that we should and can live in covenant with one another. Now, those of you who are part of the United Church of Christ and have any familiarity with it, know that the entire polity of the United Church of Christ is based on the idea of covenant. It means that we come together, we're going to hear the word actually when we have new members later, they enter into the covenant. It's a promise and an obligation and it's binding. It is binding covenantal relationship. What we do in baptism, in accepting new members, in marriages, in ordination, right? In installation, when Pastor Rob was installed, we talked about entering into a covenant. All of those are covenantal relationships. We take them very seriously. Or perhaps we should. Okay? We take them very seriously. The covenant idea is central to our faith. Central. Now, the fact that God has established a covenant, not just with humanity, but with every creature on the earth, should give us pause. If nothing more, it should give us pause. Think about this. God is in covenant with every living creature. Every crow, every cow, every cicada, every column. God is in covenant with every living creature. God has a relationship with every living creature on the earth. Every living creature. And guess what? God's relationship with those creatures has nothing to do with us. That's the amazing thing. They're out there doing their thing. <laughs> in relationship with God. Right? It's got nothing in fact, they were doing it for a very long time before we came home. They were out there. Now, this relationship with God, the beluga, the belugas congregate every year. They go up into the shallows. They have a very tough skin. And they're the most vocal of all of the whale-type creatures. They gather in these giant pods. They go into the shallow waters and they roll get all the dead skin off their backs, and while they're there rolling, there's no people around. They're just out there rolling and they're chattering the entire time. They're the most vocal. They go, 
the mosquito that is driving him mad, the locust waking from its 17 year sleep, which you're all going to hear this summer. Each and every one of those creatures is in relationship with God. God has established a covenant with them. They are bound to God. They are bound. Now, if we take that seriously, which I believe as believers we must, then it should at least shift our perspective a little bit. Or at least push us to ask some questions. Does it matter how I treat other creatures? Does it matter? How is that connected to my faith? What does God wish for us when it comes to creation and how we interact with other creatures? How does my own practice of compassion as part of my discipleship extend beyond me and get lived out in relationship with other creatures? These are questions we need to ask as believers. We need to ask them. I want to get to a place where the church reflects a comment that was made to me by a Mennonite farmer years ago. I was with a group of people and we went, it was an environmental uh, symposium, and we went to a farm, this is in upstate New York, large number of Mennonite and Amish farmers on Cuca Lake, and we were talking with this farmer, and he was actually, um, had decided not to use pesticide on his apple trees, which anybody who knows anything about apple farming is a difficult decision to make because it's very hard to grow apples without some type of pest control. And as we talked to him, and he talked about the land, and we felt about the land, and the creatures that he cares for, and so forth, um, one of my compatriots said, oh, it's just so wonderful that you're such an environmentalist. I was a little embarrassed, but that's okay. He said, I'm not an environmentalist. I just love the Lord. And that has always stayed with me. Because it says to me that the care of creation, the interaction with other creatures, it's not something that we add on because environmentalism is in or because it's a good idea. It is a good idea. But it's integral to our faith in some way. And it needs to be. It needs to be. Okay, so let me say that this is complex, multifaceted, right? I'm not proposing, at least not this morning, to take on factory farming, Monsanto's, Ford hunting, animals used in research, and the like. All of that would make a very interesting discussion for another time. What I do want to do is I want us to focus on our own small lives, each of us, our own lives, how each of our faith, in some way, our faith lives, reflects a respect for the covenant that God has made with these creatures in each of our own lives. How do we actually live that? How do we live it? Now, the starting point I believe, and I believe this is a starting point for all spiritual life, is humility and respect as bottom line. Starting that should be our starting gate, right? Humility and respect. Humility because we stand aware that other creatures do not belong to us. Now, what's interesting about that is that we tend to forget that. Isn't that incredible? This collie, okay, I shouldn't have looked like that. <laughs> this wonderful, loving collie who lives in my house and I care for does not belong to me. She does not belong to me. She belongs to God. Right away, that should affect how I consider my treatment of her and what happens to her. Because I've been entrusted with her. So our humility comes at first because we stand aware that creatures do not belong to us. They belong to God and they are not ours to do with as we please. They belong to God. We have to at least think about it. And then respect because it's the attitude for approaching anything that belongs to God. Right? All of creation. People or creation. The bottom line is respect. That's the attitude where we start. There is inherent value and worth, and this is one of the arguments that has gone on for hundreds of years. As believers, there is no other position than this, that the creation has inherent value and worth, period. That includes the creatures. 
inherent value and worth, which means right away we have to have a different posture toward them. That value and worth is granted by God, not by us. The mosquito, the elephant, and the cat bird all have inherent worth because we believe they are works of the Creator's hand. Now, if you've ever studied the life of any creature, whether it be a dog, a mouse, seriously, mouse, we'll come back to the mice later, mouse, each is a work of art. Each life is a work of art. That's how seriously we need to look at this. Now, I want to consider three ways to approach this. Here's my little rhyming scheme, okay? Be aware, take care, and learn to share. This sounds like a children's song, doesn't it? <laughs> Be aware, take care, and learn to share. But I think these are very serious. <coughs> being aware. What does it mean to be aware? It means that we start being conscious of how we think about animals. Being conscious of it, actually thinking about it. Each creature is alive. Each creature has a life. That means that the smallest creature, this mouse, this tiny thing has a tiny life within it. That is a beautiful, God-created life. It doesn't mean that all the mice that come into connection with us are going to survive. <laughs> but it does mean that we take very seriously the life of that creature. Because each one is a life. And I believe, and I've had arguments with people about this, that the death of creatures should never be an opportunity for crass celebration. There often is celebration on the death of a creature. If you study any indigenous culture, you know that. It comes with the provision of food or community. Crass celebration is different, or even worse, a source of humor. That the suffering and death of any creature could be a source of humor is contrary to gospel. I believe that. Respect for creatures includes awareness of animal maps. Now, this is where I get into the most interesting discussions with people. If you look at the human world, all right, let's pretend we're looking down from an aerial view of ranger, okay, or elk. We look at it, we see a map, we see our roads, which are, for all intents and purposes, permanent, okay? So we have these permanent highways and roads, we've got structures that are permanent, and so forth. And that's how we move around. What's interesting is to realize that animal maps if you were to superimpose them on top of ours, are completely different. The map of the root of the deer is completely different. They don't walk on our sidewalks. They might go for a while and something. <coughs> but they don't move on our highways. They have their own roots. They have their own maps. Those maps intersect with ours. It's problematic. You know, someone will say to me, Squirrel is so stupid, just ran right into me. Well, you could say, I ran right into the squirrel. Because the squirrel is moving on its map. Its sense of reality. Those maps are very, very different. The deer have been moving in a particular map in a particular direction for thousands of years. They were moving in that map, in that territory, before there were homes here. It's a very different way of looking at reality. Be aware, we share space, our maps overlap, okay? It also means an awareness of habitat. We'll talk more about habitat in a minute. But the places where creatures live. <coughs> it also means awareness of where your food comes from. And this is something that I know a lot of people have been thinking about lately. And I do think this matters. If you're a meat eater, where does it come from? Who raises it? How is it raised? How is it cared for? It matters. As believers, 
the complexities of other creatures. It means being aware of them and respecting them, not just intelligence. Human beings have a neocortex. That makes us different from any other creature. But when it comes to intelligence, there's an unbelievable amount of intelligence in the animal world. And the emotional systems for some creatures, particularly social animals like dogs, wolves, coyotes, is the same as for human beings. It's also true for chickens. They are also social creatures, as are cows. Okay. This is an awareness. Build up your awareness. Think about it. Learn about it. Get ourselves out of the center. And instead of seeing us as a center with everything is related to us, we are part of a web where everything else is there and we are part of that web. That's the awareness. Then there's the taking care. And that means being conscious of how you live with other creatures in the web of life. Consider how you care for them and their habitats. Now, the way that things are set up right now in our society is that uh, we have a great rhetoric about invasion. If you, if you listen to, um, if you watch TV, you'll see advertising about how your home is being invaded. It's being invaded. Disgusting creatures. They carry horrible things. Yeah, some of them do, right? But the rhetoric is invasion. It's enemy. It's kill. Watch for it. There's a great ad that came out last year, not great ad, but a great example of an ad that came out last year where a guy says, I don't care what they are, I just want them dead. Okay. We need to think and we need to reflect and we need to be careful. We need to be careful so that when we act, we're taking into account the other creatures with whom we're sharing this life. Be aware. Think about how our actions affect our habitats. One of the best things you can do to care for other creations, creatures, is to get rid of your lawn. Now you might say, my lawn is my pride and joy. <laughs> and believe me, I've got neighbors. They're out there measuring and everything. <laughs> There's not a single dandelion. But the research has shown us in the past few years, one of the things that happens in our world, in our society, is the sterility of lawns. Creatures can't survive there. And maybe that's the idea, right? Okay. Gardens, they're a very good thing. Water source, very good thing. Our homes, how we care for our homes and what we allow into our homes or not into our homes and how we do that, all needs to be thought about. We care for creatures by protecting their habitat and by creating habitat, even micro-habitat. Several years ago, um, I had a yard that was all grass, and I built a little <coughs> tiny pond fountain. It was surrounded by stones. And I put this little bubbling thing in it, and I didn't do anything else. And within a very short period of time, I had frogs. Where did they come from? That's one of those things I really heard about. They have generated out of the water with you know, the word of life and so forth. But they were there. And then one day I go out there and there's a snake sunning on one of the stones. It's incredible how fast it happens. The care for creation by creating even microhabitats, Supporting efforts to care other places. The Potawatomi Zoo. Okay? The zoos in Chicago that do tremendous research around the world. World Wildlife Month. And then be careful about your terminology, how you talk about creatures. When you see a mouse, does it result in a, oh, it's so disgusting? Or does it result in, okay, there's a mouse. I'm going to have to figure out how to get it out of the kitchen. <laughs> okay, I get that. But think about how we talk about animals to our children the ways that we refer to them. And then finally, we have to learn how to share. We must do a better job of giving way. Giving way. And here's the hard part. We believe we have been given dominion over the earth. And in 
large sense, that's true. We have been given dominion. But we also believe that that means we can do whatever we want, which it doesn't, and it never has. If you read the law of the ancient Israelites, you will see they were not allowed to do whatever they wanted to when it came to animals. They could not take everything out of the nest and leave nothing behind. Okay? We have to embrace, and this is the hard part, we have to embrace limits to our own expansion. And I mean individually, as well as Embracing limits to our own expansion. What does that mean for us personally? Sometimes it means there's more effort needed, a bit of sacrifice. Let me tell you a funny story. I decided, and you're, you'll probably think I'm nuts, but that's okay. My parents do, and yet they think it's kind of charming at the same time. I live trap mice. I don't set mouse traps. Okay? My parents set mouse traps. I tell them not to. Sometimes I trip them so that they catch anything. You know what? Catching mice with live traps, it doesn't take a lot of effort. Okay? Well, several years ago, I lived in a house that I often thought would be a great children's book if you would just cut it in half. You could have a cross-section of how here are where the bats are living, here are where the snakes are living, here are where the mice are living. All these creatures that kept trying to come into my home. And I would trap the live trap mice. And then every morning when I walked my dog way down the road, I would carry the little half-part trap with me, and I'd release the mouse when I got down the end of the road. Well, one morning, I see Randy, who's a retired judge, lives way down the other end of the road. He walks up to my end of the road every day with his dog, and in his hand is a half-part trap. I'm not kidding. And I went out there, and I said, what is that? And he said, oh, I trap my mice, and I bring them up here and let them go. <laughs> We got the mouse merry-go-round. <laughs> Move it along. Under this now, what's interesting is that that seems like an odd thing, and yet for me, that has become very, very important. I can't live any other way. I have to do that for me, personally. And it differs from person to person what that means. But learning to share our space and putting some limits on our own expansion, which is the automatic move in our culture is to kill. It is. That's what we're told, that we should kill. Um, I actually went to the bird, bird food store, and a man was there saying, well, how do I get the starlings out of my bluebird house? And she said, well, you know, there's a trap that you can buy that, you know, will live trap them. And, uh, and he's like, oh, okay. And he's like, yeah, but then, you know, you're just kind of you know, you know, he's like, well, I'm not going to kill them. And I was so stunned that this was considered an option by a place that encourages the care of creatures. There are people out there who will come and do it for you and do it in a humane way. So look for them instead of immediately thinking about how to kill what's outside your home. Learning to share our space. We have to work harder at education, at finding alternate paths to dealing with things. You know, the wolves have just come back into the UP of Michigan, and they have just reopened hunting season. Okay. How do we do this? We have to talk more about it. You know what? Christians aren't engaged in these conversations. The church could be a leader in this. All right, bottom line, why do this? Why do this? Because we're part of the web, even though we don't want to think that way, we're part of the web. All of these creatures are connected to us. All you have to do is reflect on the, the, uh, what happened with EDT to know that. All of these creatures are connected to us. But here's another reason that we don't think about a lot. Human life flourishes when it's lived in conjunction with the natural world. It flourishes. There's been some research done recently about how much happier, how much healthier, how much more mentally uh, enriched people are who live in a place who can see something that is wild, or at least that is natural, that is open space. There's research backing this up. It makes a difference. What are the most successful prison rehabilitation programs out there? There are two. Working with dogs and gardening. <coughs> they decrease recidivism rates.
rates dramatically. The natural world and our place in it, that's how we flourish. Not by controlling it and destroying it, but by learning to live, to be aware, to care, and to share it. That's how we flourish. And as believers, we have to. We have to. So I will say this in closing. I don't know if I'm going to leave you. I'll leave these animals up here until the end of the service. So you can look at them. And you can think about the merry-go-round of mice. <laughs> they didn't know New York. But consider this. We are a covenantal people. We live within a creation that is covenanted with God. God has covenanted with creation. We live in it. We all have the same landlord. We all have the same landlord. The practice of our discipleship extends beyond the treatment of other people. It has to. It includes all of creation. So whether you, it's just you and your little dog in your apartment, and that's it, that's it. Or if you've got 1,500 head of dairy cattle on a 7,500-acre farm, you share the same landlord. How you treat that one little dog in your apartment, or how you treat those 1,500 head of cattle on your farm, matters as a believer. It matters. We share the same land. The bottom line is this. Our treatment of the creatures around us reflects our hearts and it reflects our faith.